You know, for the past Sundays, if you notice, the messages of our church are actually pertaining to relationships. You know, relationships with God and relationships with others. The key verse was, love the Lord your God with all your heart and also love your neighbors as yourself. Amen? Uh, Pastor Jen shared about loving others, loving your leaders. Pastor Terrence shared about family, you know, those uh, messages. And last week, Pastor David shared about loving your your neighbor, but more than that, loving your enemies. Enemies, yeah. So all of this are pertaining to relationships. And how we relate to God is actually how we relate to others, all right? How we relate to God is also how we relate to others. And how we relate to God is actually our ultimate priority, Amen. How we relate to God is our ultimate priority. You know, if you remember what I shared, uh, I think it was four, three or four Sundays ago, that spending time with Jesus is our ultimate priority. Sitting at His feet, listening to Him, communicating with Him, that's our number one priority in life. Who remembered that message, you know? That is from Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. If you remember Martha, you know, Jesus is coming to their house. What did Martha do? Martha and Mary, they were preparing a lot of things. Dinner, taking care of the house. And when Jesus came into the house, Martha was still doing the dinner while Mary dropped off everything, sat at the feet of Jesus, and listened to his voice, you know? And that is one thing that will not be taken away from Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his voice. And Jesus said, that is the most important thing in our life. More than anything else is to really spend time with Jesus. That is our ultimate priority. So my question is, how is our quiet moments with the Lord? How is our devotions every day? Are we making time to read our Bibles, opening it, and praying? Because that is really our ultimate goal in life. And I really pray that we are hungry and thirsty to read from the Bible. Amen? And today, I will be sharing an important outcome that when we spend time with Jesus and we get to know Him as Lord and Savior, there will be a great outcome in our life. And that outcome is that we will make an impact in the life of others. It's still relationship, you know? And how can we make an impact or how can we uh, bring enduring influence in the life of others is by actually becoming the salt in life. I will repeat that again. If we spend more time with Jesus, knowing Him more and more, the outcome of our lives is that we will become what? Salt and light of the earth. Amen? So let's turn our Bibles in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Um, if you don't have your Bibles, I encourage you to always bring your Bible, all right? But we also have a Bible underneath. Uh, Pastor David said last week, right? Bring your Bibles. We also have Bibles underneath. So just uh, open it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. And it says here, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it loses its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Verse 14, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Verse 15, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And lastly, verse 16, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Praise God for the reading of His word. So my question is, why are we actually called the salt of the earth, you know? It is very clear. It says in Matthew 5 verse 13, we are the salt of the earth. To give you a context of this verse, in Beatitudes, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was actually talking to a huge crowd, all right, and his disciples. And he was teaching the Beatitude before this verse is. And suddenly he said, he turned to the fifth to his believers, to the followers, and he said, you are the light, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the earth, of, of, the, of the world. That is the context of this verse. So my question is, why are we called the salt of the earth? What does that mean? 
You know, in those early days, they, they used salt to preserve food, all right? They used salt to preserve food. And they used it to preserve meat. They used it to tenderize meat. That's the only way they can use it because they don't have an LG, Samsung, Panasonic freezer, okay? They don't have a built-in two-door, two-door, uh, 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 what do you call this, fridge with, a, with an LCD like that. They don't have that, all right? They only have salt, all right? And they get it from, from, from somewhere. They purify the salt. They get it from the sea. They purify it. And that's the way of them to preserve meat or food. And um, salt is very important in the early days, and until now, we actually use salt to what? To cook our food, to make delicious meal, and that's a way of adding flavor and still preserving our food. Without salt, food is ill, you know? You make adobo, our Philippine dish, and no salt, it's like, ugh, all right? You make steak without salt, it's like, mm. even though it's so beautifully done, if without salt, it doesn't add anything. And as followers of Jesus, we also have the preserving effect like salt, all right? We have the preserving effect like salt because as followers of Jesus, we carry a message that help people from the harm of sin, okay? We help them. We have the, the message of eternal life. We have a message of hope and a message of how people can prevent themselves experiencing eternal condemnation in hell. That's the reason why we are called the salt of the earth because we have that preserving message of hope. That preserving message that Jesus came to save and seek who was lost. Amen? We have that message of hope. We have that inside of us. Do you have that inside your heart? Come on. Who has that inside your heart? That is our preserving message to people. That's the reason why we are called the salt of the earth. Amen? Do you agree with that? Amen. Amen. You are the salt of the earth. But the next word says, but what good is it if the salt loses its flavor or has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And what does this verse mean? We know now that as Christians, we have that preserving message of the gospel, like what does salt do? We can share it, we can preach it, you know, we can say it. But more than preaching the gospel to people, remember this, our actions and deed will speak louder than what we say. Amen? Our actions and deed will speak louder than what we say. I love what Henry shared about the Good Samaritan. He can just say, God bless you to that poor, you know, to that, to that, uh, uh, back, to that, uh, uh, um, uh, person who has been, been wounded, you know. But that Good Samaritan just did not say, God bless you. He made an action. That action spoke louder than what he can say. And that's why when we do not live godly lives, but yet say things about Jesus, post Bible verses in Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, but the people don't see us aligning our actions to what we say, we lose our saltiness, all right? Or we diminish the saltiness in our Christian life and it won't make a lasting result or influence in the life of others. So that's what that verse says, you know, what good is it if you say that you are a salt, but you don't have the saltiness in you, you're just good as nothing. You're just good as trampling around underneath your foot. That's what Jesus says. So if we don't live our godly lives and say about Jesus, people won't believe what we say. They believe our actions more than our words. Amen? It's like saying to my children, you know, Angela Elijah, do not eat chocolate. That's really bad for you, okay? That's full of sugar, that's unhealthy, that's full of carbohydrates. Don't eat that, all right? And here I go to pack and save, <laughs> getting a lot of chocolates, you know, sitting in my couch, eating it while watching television, and be becoming, you know, and then my children will say, Mom, you told me to buy chocolates, what are you doing? It's the, do you get the, do you get the analogy? You know, saying words, but don't do not do it in action. It's just like that. Kid, my children will not believe in what I say. So I hope we are getting the point about salt and the saltiness, you know. If, so if we preach about the Bible and say all good things about 
loving your enemies, loving your neighbor, showing hospitality. You know, watch your tongue. Do not speak bad words. Do not say bad jokes. Do not be easily angered. Do be honest. You know, make God number one in your life. And yet we do not practice them. Those who are watching in our lives will never believe what we say. Instead of us making a lasting impact in their lives, we lose our saltiness and become a stumbling block instead. And our testimony will be, as what the Bible says, trampled underfoot as worthless. Alright? So remember, what people see in us is always a reflection of what we say about Jesus. Alright? So what people see in us is always a reflection about what we see in Jesus. There was a story of a man who was a renowned leader for the people in India. And in seeking to overthrow British colonial rule of his native land, he was an avid reader. Although he was a Hindu in his quest of freedom, he read the four Christian Gospels, you know. He wanted to know about Jesus of Nazareth. In his reading of the Gospels, he was impressed with this man, Jesus, whom Christians worship and follow. Where could he find out more about this Jesus whom Christians refer to as Christ the Messiah? So what this man did, one Sunday morning, he visited one of the Christian churches in Calcutta, India. Upon seeking entrance to the church sanctuary, he was stopped by the ushers in the door. The ushers told him that he was not welcome. You're not welcome here, okay? You're not welcome here. Example, that's the, 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 the church. You stop. You're not welcome in this church. And the usher told him that you're not welcome, you are not permitted to attend this church because you are not a high caste Indian and only whites, okay, white people can enter this church. He was not a high caste, he was not a British, he was not even white colored. Because of that rejection by the church, he and his followers turned his back on Christianity. With this act, he rejected the Christian faith, never again to consider the claims of Christ. He was turned off by the sin of segregation that was practiced in the church. This man was no other than Mahatma Gandhi, who was one of the leaders of the religion of Hinduism, a political person and a leader of, um, of, of Hinduism. He said, he said this, he declared, I'd be a Christian if I were not for, sorry, I'd be a Christian if it were not for the Christians. And I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Imagine that, you know, Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. It doesn't seem like your Christians are like your Christ. This was actually written by Reverend Patterson. He even said, if Christians acted like Christ, the whole world will be all Christians. All right, he said this, if Christians well, uh, acted like Christ, everybody will be Christians. Even Mother Teresa said this about Gandhi, that Gandhi felt fascinated at knowing Christ. He met Christians and he felt let down. Imagine a person coming to a church, you know, because he was not white colored. He said, go away. You cannot step into a church. You know, we cannot step here. We you know when Gandhi passed away, over a million people joined a five long funeral procession that took five hours. Procession, the funeral procession that took five hours. Imagine how much people he was influenced by his life. What if you imagine Gandhi became a Christian when he attended that church and instead of teaching him the wisdom and other beliefs, he pointed these people to Jesus. These millions of people could have been saved. They could have been Christians. Amen? Gandhi was that close, that close of becoming a Christian. But because the church lost its saltiness, they did not practice loving your neighbor, whether you're color, race, stature. This one man who had influenced millions of people said, your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Very heartbreaking, eh? Very heartbreaking. You know, every time I am reminded with this story, I always have a reflection to myself and I always pray, Lord, may I not be a stumbling block to others. May I not be a stumbling block to others. On the other hand, the Bible did not 
not say that we should be perfect Christians, all right? Because nobody can be a perfect Christian. In our own human capacity, we cannot be salty or effective in our Christian walk. As one pastor said, a Christian life is an impossible life. Impossible. Because it is really hard to walk the talk. But you know what? God promised that He is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can think or ask for. In Ephesians 3.20, He can actually change us to become more like Him. It is God's ability to change our lives. It is God's ability to change us if we humble ourselves and say, Lord, I need you. I need you to change me. The Bible says we who have Christ in us can see and reflect the glory of God so we can change from glory to glory to become more like Him. The Bible did not say be perfect Christians. Do not, you know, do not, uh, do not sin or something like that. Yes, it says do not sin, but honestly, we still fall short. We still fall short in the glory of God, which means, which means we need to look to Jesus. We need to really look to Jesus and say, Lord, is there anything in my heart that is not pleasing to you at this moment? Lord, change me, transform me, because I want to be more like you. Amen? This is called the process of sanctification. You know, it is the ongoing process of God purifying our lives. Who is in the process of sanctification? Because, it, honestly, people of God, while we're still here on earth, God needs to purify our lives. Amen? God needs to purify ourselves. Yes, we have been justified when we are born again Christians. He forgave our sins when we repented. We got an assurance that we will be in heaven with Him. Praise God. But when we got to be born again and still living on earth, it was never an instant fix. It was never an instant perfect fix for us. That when, you know, that we say the right things, that we don't get angry anymore. No. We, you know, we think of ourselves already clean and perfect, nothing wrong with us, then we just really have pride. And we, we know when we call God a liar in 1 John 1, 10, if we don't acknowledge that we really need God to transform us, all right? This, uh, this afternoon, before we actually went here, me, Terrence, Andrew, Elijah, we prayed in the car. You know, we prayed in the car. Because sometimes it's really chaotic before going to church, I tell you, you know. With two kids, it's so chaotic. So I said to them, guys, before we go to church, let's pray. So we were in the car, Terrence prayed, and I really love the prayer of my husband. He's really the best. He said, Lord, fix our hearts before we enter your presence. Fix our hearts. And then I think it made an impact to Andrew because when Andrew prayed, his first sentence was, Lord, I pray that you will fix my heart. <laughs> he said that as well, Lord, fix my heart. I think because the issue came from him, you know, so, so Lord, fix my heart. And then Elijah copied it as well, Lord, forgive me too. Sorry, we fight. Fix my heart. And then uh, in my turn, I said, Lord, I pray they understand what they're being saying. But the prayer of children are powerful and effective, amen? And I really love it because we really need to ask God, Lord, fix ourselves, you know? If you study Pastor David's series, Are You Saved? and reflect on it, actually we have 12 series already, and uh, we're posting it on our website really soon. Pastor David has been discussing the transformation and evidences if we are really saved, you know, like having an obedient life, knowing how to worship God, knowing how to be generous. And last week, we were talking about loving our neighbors. These are all God's way of sanctifying us so we can be salt and light of the earth. I encourage you, go and really review Pastor David's Are You Saved um, series. It's really good. And it's all in the process of sanctification so that we can be salt and salt of the earth. You know, how do we do this? How do we become salt of the earth? I don't have an answer to you but this. We really need to open our Bibles and pray every day. I don't have a quick fix. I don't have any solution. But the only solution I can tell you is to read your Bible every day. I cannot emphasize it anymore, you know. I've been rallying this over the years. Open your Bible, read it, pray, because this will speak to us, and this word will change our life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Are we getting something this afternoon? Tell your neighbor, you are the 
salt of the earth. Come on, you are the salt of the earth. Tell yourself, I am the salt of the earth. Come on, I am the salt. I am the salt of the earth. Hallelujah. Let's go to the next verse and it says, You are the light of the world, like a city on the hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now tell your neighbor, you are the light of the world. Now tell your neighbor, you are the light. A while ago, you have a salt. Now you are the light of the world. Amen. And what does it mean, you know? If the salt carries a preserving message of hope, what does the light of the world mean? You know, a light is always meant to shine, all right? A light is always meant to radiate, okay? You don't hide it under a basket. Instead, you put it on a stand that should be seen, you know, by everyone. We shine the light of, oh, sorry, we shine the light of Christ in this dark world. We do not copy what people do in darkness, but rather we act the opposite. Amen? That's the meaning of shining your light because we are meant to shine. We are meant to radiate, you know. We are meant to be the opposite people of the dark world. Amen? That's what we should do. We shine the light we have in Christ so that people will be drawn to Jesus. Jesus draw people to himself. Our only role is to shine, all right? It's Jesus' job to put people to himself, but our role is to shine. We do what is right in the eyes of God, and men and people will just be attracted to Jesus. People will just be attracted to Jesus. You know, there was a testimony at our church back home where there was a one uncle, so this is a friend of my dad. He invited his niece and nephew because the family is not Christian, and he could not share the gospel to his sister or to his brother-in-law. So what he did was to bring the children to church. Good strategy, right? Get the kids to go to church. All right, so he brought the, ch the children to, to, to the church. They were almost teenagers. And then Sunday after Sunday, um, this, is my, this is one of our good friends, um, Uncle Dan. He already went home with the Lord. So he brought the children to church, all right? And Sunday after Sunday, the, church, the, the kids were going to church. The kids were doing youth camps, you know, they were attending Bible study groups and everything. And then the mom and dad saw the change to the to this uh, preteens, you know, teenagers, right? They're in this hormonal <laughs> change, you know. They they can answer back, you know, those kind of things. But these children, because they have been attending, you know, Christian uh, 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 camps and everything, their lives were really changed. Suddenly, they were not talking back to the mom and dad. You know, they were really praying. And the mom and dad, the brothers and sister of my, my uncle, said, what is this? Let's go to that church. So they went to the church because of the change they saw with their children. So they went to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And praise God, the whole family got saved. Praise God. And not only that, the dad, the, the brother-in-law of, 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 of this uncle, became a pastor, you know? Amen. It was just because the change of their children was seen evident in the house. They were attracted to the Jesus that they are now worshiping. And now the whole family is saved. Amen? That's how our light should shine. People get attracted to the change and transformation that we have, you know, and they will ask, who is that Jesus he served? I want that Jesus. And they become curious until they have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. You know, a light is always clean and pure, clear and pure. A light does not change. What we see is what we get. So should be our lives inside and outside our home. Whether we are alone or in the company of believers, most especially with unbelievers, we need to reflect God in our lives. In and outside the home, alone or with the company of people, Amen. we need to reflect the light of God in our lives. But my friends, it's really up to you how bright do you want your light to shine. 
Because how can we shine our light to people around us in a daily basis? You know, when you go to when you go to work, can you actually sing? What a beautiful name it is! You know, can I, when I go to my work, you know, can I preach the gospel in front of my workmates? Of course not. When Toyafil goes to ASP, can he bring his Bible to his boss? Read chapter like this. Can I do that? Of course not. You know, they will say you're weird. You know, you don't you don't do that. So how? You know, in our daily basis, you know, you can really shine bright in a daily basis if you really have the hope and joy in Jesus. Your smile and countenance will brighten your home. Smile. You'll be sweeter to your spouse and loving to your children. That's one way of shining your light to Jesus because you have hope. You have joy in your heart. You know, if you have Jesus in your heart, will you have a grumpy face? You know, I'm going to go to work. You know, I have Jesus in my heart. You know, grumpy, you know. No, when you, when you get home, hug your children, hug your, 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 your wife, you know. Be happy, be joyful because you have Jesus in your heart. Smile and your countenance will brighten your workplace instead of complaining with your boss, you know, or join the people who complains at work. Pray and gladly do what you're doing and then complain to God, Lord, you know, just put your problems to the Lord. This is my problem at work. Don't say your problems to your, your workmates, but instead lift it up to God. Your gesture of handshake and greeting someone will bring a blessing to that person. You know what attracted me as well in this church? is the hugs of Pastor David and Pastor Jennifer. Every time, no, no Sunday, they, they did not hug me. Since I came 2015 here, never was a Sunday that they, Pastor David did not tell me, call me when you need me, okay? Except money, all right? They would always say that. That's what attracted me, of course, to the Word of God, but the gesture of our dear pastors, I said, this is real. This is authentic, you know. And when you go to their house, they're still the same. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not um, pretending. You know, we've been to their house, it's all the same. Their hands shake, their gesture, that's a blessing. You know, you don't say foul words at work or join dirty, dirty jokes. That's also how you will shine, you know. Oh, that person, he doesn't say bad words, you know. Oh, that person, he doesn't join our evil jokes. You're being honest with the people around you while others are being dishonest. You know, that's one way of shining your light. And then so much examples that I can say. There is something different in you, you know, that they see and they will, they will be attracted to the light that you have. You don't need to, you know, yes, we do need to preach the gospel if we have the opportunity, really sit down and talk about Jesus. But more than that, they're going to look at your actions. Our actions will speak louder than our words. You know, I have a workmate um, in, in, at, 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 you know, in my ward. She doesn't really smile a lot. She doesn't smile. She was just helping me, and I really got attracted to her countenance. Just the mere peace that I can feel with her. And then we had a chance talking to one another. We talked about religion. And true enough, she was a born-again Christian, you know? And she's also a daughter of the pastor. And I told her, you know what? There's really something different in you. I, and then, you know, we were like, we were both pastor's kids. And we had a common thing. There's really something, I tell you. If you are a Christian in your workplace and you shine your light, people will just get attracted. And I believe that Jesus is happy at that time. You know, as I end, our light should point people to the right direction. It becomes a guide to the right path. And as the light of the world, we point people to Christ. We do not point them to ourselves. Never point people to yourselves. We point them that leads to the source of life. And light who is no other than our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, in my conclusion, my question is, are we acting as the salt and light of the earth? You know, it was not a suggestion of Jesus. If you look at the verses, it's not, could you please be a salt and light of the earth? No. Did it say in Matthew 5, can you please be a salt and light of the earth? No. Jesus already declared, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. He already said that, you know, but rather he really declared.
declared when Jesus ascended to earth, you know, with, uh, from earth to heaven, he will come back one day. But while he is still not coming back, he gave us a task to shine our lights to the world. He gave us a task to bring the gospel to the people. Take note of the people who is watching you, who is listening to you, who is around you, and who you are making impact with. Can they say that you are becoming a salt and light? Can they say that Jesus is in you? Your closest is your dearest. So ask your spouse tonight, am I shining brightly to you, my love? <laughs> ask your children, is mama and papa shining their lights to you? All right. All right, your closest or your dearest. If you have an accountability group in church, you know, it's good to ask, you know, what are the things that you see in me right now? Is my words becoming a blessing to you or is it becoming a curse already? You ask as well, you know, to your leaders. And as I end, our prayer should be, Lord, is there anything in my words, action, or aspect in my life that has lost its saltiness or my light is not shining as bright as you want? Reveal it, Lord. Change me, Lord, and use me for your glory. I will end now. The message is for everyone. But before God said the message, he said it to me first. So I really have to reflect, Lord, I don't want to be a stumbling block. Amen? I want to be, I want to follow your instructions. I want to honor you with everything I am until I die, until I see you face to face. And I pray that this is your prayer too. And I pray that this really spoke to your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's come to the Lord and let's close with prayer. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your word that brings life. I thank you for your word that brings uh, greatness, Lord, in our lives. Lord, your word changes us, O oh God. Your word transforms us, O oh God. So, Father, I pray for each and every one, Lord. Lord, that you would help us to really open our Bibles and pray every day. Help us to really, Lord, desire, Lord God, to be hungry for you every day. Help us to sit at your feet, Lord, to really listen to you every day. So that when we reflect, Lord, your words in our lives, Lord, we will be humble enough. We will be humble enough and say, Lord, change me because I want to be more like you. I want to be a blessing to people. I don't want to be a curse to them, Lord. I don't want to be a stumbling block to them, Lord God. And Father, I pray, Lord, that each and every one will have a desire to share the word of God. Lord, you have called us to be the salt and light, Lord God. So I pray, Lord, that you would release the spirit of evangelism in this church, Lord. That once we share you, oh God, people will just believe in the name of Jesus because they can see it in us and through us, oh God. Help us, Lord. This is your work and not our work, Lord. So we're just submitting ourselves to you in your mighty name, Lord. Lord, thank you again. Thank you again. Reveal more of yourselves in our lives, oh God. Hallelujah. Let's all stand up and let's just close with a word of prayer and a blessing. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for everything that you have spoken today. Thank you for the joy that we receive in church. Thank you for the fellowship of one another. Thank you for all Lord, reviving our hearts this afternoon, O oh God. And I really pray, Lord, that as we depart from this place, I pray that your spirit will be upon us, Lord God. You would help us throughout the week, Lord, until we see each other again. And I pray for the peace of God that transcends all understanding shall guard our hearts and minds. Lord, if there's any doubts right now, take it away, Lord. Lord, if we need direction in our lives, would you get, Lord, give us that direction in our life right now. Would you clear, Lord, our, our, our mind so that we may know your will in us and through us and let the peace of God flow upon each and everyone. Lord, we thank you for your word. We are the salt and light, Lord, and we will do it for your glory. In Jesus' name and all the mighty people of God say, Amen. Amen.